one. Hey gang, welcome back. It's me again, Ryan and Peter Fields. And today we're going to shift gears a little bit and we're going to do a little bit of a time skip. We're gonna jump from the world of the 1920s and the 1930s. Uh, most of the stories we've read so far, aside from Arthur Macon's White People, were written during the 30s. And we're now gonna make a jump of about 70 years. And we're gonna to jump to the 21st century, a brand new century. Now, weird stories never went away. Um, people continue to publish weird stories and they became more and more part of the horror genre over time. And uh, what's interesting is in the beginning of the 90s, but moving in mostly really coming to fruition, coming to bloom, so to speak, in the in the early uh, first 10 years of the 20th century. The, the, the 21st the, century. 21st century. The knots or whatever we're going to call them, the, 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 the zeros, whatever you want to call the, the, the first The first 20 10 years. odds. The 20 odds. The 20 odds? Is that what they call it? Okay. You see this, this new embrace of the weird. Something something comes that's called the new weird, where basically a, a whole bunch of different writers start re-looking back at the Lovecraft stories, looking back at the Lovecraft circle, looking back at the Cthulhu mythos and updating it for modern audiences and saying, again, at this point, uh, and I mean, I remember doing this as well, I remember novels being written in the 70s. As you mentioned, um, Stephen King wrote novels, Neil Gaiman wrote novels and stuff like that. But for the most part, these novels were all sort of horror, horror or mystery adjacent type stories. And what's interesting about what we're gonna call the new weird, and that's what it's called, the genre is actually called today, is it's saying, no, you're, you're misunderstanding. The weird isn't necessarily about horror. It's not necessarily about that cosmic dread. It's also about that cosmic wonder. And that's something that's been lost in these 70 years. And we're going to bring that back. We're going to, we're going to retell the weird stories. We're going to put a modern twist on it. We're going to reject some things from the past. And we're going to reinforce other things from the past. Yes. Um, the new weird. Quite possibly, if we're talking about the 20 odds, the, the first 10 years of the 21st century, if we're talking about that period of time as the beginning of the new weird, then Shogoths in Bloom. Shogoths in Bloom is perhaps the most important story out there in the new weird. It does so many important things that we associate with the new weird. Again, as you remember, right, we were talking about a progression here. We were talking about starting with Arthur Macon and the white people and the idea of the patriarchy and the fact that um, change is coming. The weird is out there and we must be on our guard and we must strike down the weird whenever whenever it pops its head up. We then move into Lovecraft who says, yeah, we need to protect against the weird, but guess what? It's already too late. We're already part of the weird. And then we finally come to C.L. Moore who says, well, maybe we can use the weird. Maybe the weird will empower us. And one of the things that me and Peter have found out about the new weird is the new weird is not only saying that the weird changes us, but it's it's also saying we can change the weird. Mm -hmm. It's saying that it's not it's not a simple revolution. It's not a simple overthrowing of of position from 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 master and servant to servant and master is a blending of ideas, blending of understanding blending of things that changes both of the things. You end up with both the normalization of the weird, the weird becoming normal, but at the same time, right. the weird also right. empowers us and gives us new avenues for change and new, uh, new avenues to become something that hasn't been seen before. Um, you're, you're already using some of our terms that are important for the new weird. Normalization normalization of the dreadful, the oddful, the, the oddful, <laughs> the a normalization of what we normally would consider just horrifically awful. Okay. The normalization of it, the taming of it. 
Okay, and, and in Shogoths in Bloom, we're talking about the most the most horrific story in the Lovecraftian canon, and that uh, not we're talking about the most horrific creature in Lovecraft, and that is the Shogoth. The Shogoths were created by the elder things, the great old ones, the first alien civilization, okay, to colonize the earth. And they did this in pre-Cambrian times. We have to go back millions and millions of years ago, 50 million years ago, maybe 150 million years ago. And I think it was like 400 million, actually, Peter. Right. And the, in other words, the elder things, the great old ones came to our planet before there was any life, and they're responsible for every life form on the planet, including these slaves that they created, these gelatinous protoplasmic characters, uh, these monsters who could do the heavy lifting of their civilization. Okay, and they were called Shogoths. Okay, and the Shogoths um, developed a, uh, a high intelligence they um at first they were simply telepathically telepathically connected to the old ones the great old ones but ultimately they developed language and they imitated their masters to the point that they rebelled at one time okay and they had to be put down okay they had to be they had to be subdued by the great old ones so here we have in elizabeth baird stories the shogoths Okay, but not the original Shogoths. Uh, Professor Harding uh, is aware that the the Shogoths, okay, the Shogoths that he's examining now off the coast of Maine, okay, these Shogoths belong to um, a, ge a genus species. It's uh, Oracupoda horribilis, but it's not Oracupoda, okay, antediluvianus. <laughs> okay, antediluvianus. Okay, that would be the primordial shogoths, but it's not them. These are a different, more evolved uh, shogoth. And so, one of the mysteries of of the story, shogoths and bloom, is how can these creatures be more evolved when they don't die? Okay, because uh, Professor Hardy has a very strong suspicion that these characters just. They just keep going on. Okay, so how can they evolve if we don't have generation upon generation, thousands of generations, millions of generations? How can they evolve when we're talking about individuals? And yet apparently uh, they they have. And I, I want to highlight something that, um, that Peter kind of mentioned in passing. Again, we're talking about the normalization of Shagas. With, with, with the old weird, with Lovecraft, the Shoggoths were, were this undescribable horror that would drive you mad from just looking at them. They're, they're, it's una, you're, they're beyond the comprehension of mankind. They are this thing that we will never understand and we must we must destroy it at all costs. And with the new weird, you're saying, no, we can we can classify them, we can study them. They they in the rules are different, but they're still rules. Um, Normalization means we have genus and species. Your acupoda, okay. Uh, that's the genus and the species horribilis. Okay, that's the particular surf variety of Shogoth that Professor Harding is examining right now. And in the story, there's also the context of race. It's all throughout the story. And we talked about the fact that, again, um, Lovecraft was a white supremacist. I don't, I, I feel very comfortable in saying that. He was, he was. If you read his letters and you read now, there are, again, he was, he was a very contrarian white supremacist who married, who hated, who was very hard anti-Semitic. Again, I mentioned married a Jewish woman. Uh, it was one of those guys that he. It, it was more like he was theoretically a white supremacist, but when it came to actually treating people right, he was very much like, "Oh no, you don't abuse people, you don't hurt people." But yes, the white people are are the best people. Again, very contrarian individual. But in this story. We get, again, we get that rejection of, of racism. We get it in actually a very, very interesting way too, because a lot of Lovecraft stories and a lot of the old weird stories are about this idea of the rise and fall of civilizations. 
the idea that and again we see that with Call of Cthulhu, specifically with the rise of Raleigh coming out of uh, coming out of the sea and then sinking back down again. It's all throughout many of Lovecraft's stories. This idea that civilizations will rise up and then they will fall back into bar uh, barbar barbarianism. Uh, one of many of the Lovecraft writers, such as Robert E. Howard, also wrote about these type of stories all the time. It's a very common theme. And what's interesting about Bear's story is it's sort of re a rejection of that idea, of that, that cyclic view of, of, of nature. Because as we know from all of you who have read the story, and you've all read the story, haven't you, uh, that uh, there is a decision to make whether or not Professor Harding is going to become the master of the Shagos and use them to right the wrongs he sees in the universe, to right all the racism wrongs in the universe. And he ultimately rejects that. And why does he reject that? Because that's falling back on the old ideas of the master and the servant. And he wants to go beyond that. He thinks, again, if you, if you, if he, he knows that even if he destroys the Nazis using the Shagas, it will not end the problem. It will just continue the cycle of of, of destruction later on. Boy, ex excellent. Yeah, we cannot help. But engage in a little bit of a spoiler here okay we the temptation is to is for human beings to become the new master of the shoguts for us to take the place of the great old ones the elder things okay in the pre-cambrian age going back millions of years ago taking the place of the elder things of the great old ones and ourselves becoming the shogoth's new master that's the temptation that the that the shogoths put directly in front of professor harding command us we are born to be servants and since this story uh elizabeth baird's story plays down the idea of the shogoth as a rebel okay a Lovecraft story, and, I, and I'm thinking about the Mountains of Madness. We're not looking at that story in this course, but in that, but in that story that tells the history of the Shogoths, the Shogoths rebelled against uh, the Great Old Ones, and they were a threat at one time. They were very intelligent, okay, and they had to be resubdued, okay. We have to remember the Great Old Ones in Lovecraft are responsible for all living things on our planet. Okay, indirectly for human beings as well. And one thing that Lovecraft says about the great old ones is they never took us, the simians, very seriously. We were the buffoons. That was the word. Okay, in, at the Mountains of Madness. We were that creature that they're responsible for, the great old ones. Okay, that they never took very seriously. And here, Elizabeth Baird, our new weird champion, there's probably not a story more important in the new weird, okay, than Shogoths and Bloom, okay. In this story, we have a marginalized victim of bias and prejudice, okay. Professing, Professor Harding is very conscious of the anti-Semitism in Europe, very conscious of that because of the segregation in America, okay. It's very conscious of marginalization okay due to racism and they he in fact there's a tension between professor harding and uh the the uh, owner of the boat bert clay okay there's a tension there until we learn that bert clay's lineage okay he comes from a family that participated in vermont okay in the underground railroad even though our story is set on the coast of maine and, and so race is prominent. And here we have Professor Harding, okay? Professor Harding, okay? A black professor, very conscious of race, okay? Very concerned about the rise of Nazism. And the Shogoths give him the opportunity to command the Shogoths. And the Shogoths literally could take over the world. The Shogoths cannot be defeated. They, they're, they're, uh, their status okay in the weird okay is at the top of the, the food chain okay and yet what uh, professor harding ultimately does is really important for elizabeth baird and, and the new and the new weird break the cycle a break lot of the, the cycle. 
a lot of the white supremacist fears, especially Lovecraft was a, was a, was a, a victim of to some extent. He was raised as a white supremacist. Is the idea that if we give minorities power, then we will become the the unpowered minority. The white the white people will become the oppressed people of the world, and that's why we must put down all the other races. And Elizabeth Bear saying that's nonsense. She's saying that's absolute nonsense. The idea that that um, that if if we give people of color, if we give women power, suddenly it will be the white males who are going to be the oppressed people of the world. And so I think that's what, so. Let's review a uh, new weird. New weird is self aware. Okay. It's not naive. It knows what it's doing with the weird, with the Lovecraftian weird. It even directly repeats important motifs of the weird we associate with Lovecraft, like Shogoths. Okay, the the weird, no, the, the new weird normalizes the weird to the point that we have genus and species now when we're talking about Shogoths. The new weird empowers the weak. Okay, the outside become the inside, the, uh, the servant becomes the master, but we're not going to repeat cycles, okay? The cycles of primordial history over millions, and sometimes hundreds of millions of years is that today's slave will be tomorrow's master, okay? The victim will be the monster, and they just take turns. That's actually a white supremacist argument, implies Elizabeth Bear, and we're going to fight that. The new weird is going to say that those are not the only choices. Another aspect of the new weird also is going to the idea, not only does the, the, the weird change us, but we also change the weird. I love that. That's a uh, in the new weird, the 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 person who is outside informs the inside. Okay, we're not we who feel who feel overpowered, overwhelmed. Okay, by our own sig insignificance. In compared to the cause, in comparison to the cosmos, we have been empowered by that very cosmos. Okay, so let's talk about our other story, our other new weird story. Another story okay, by Elizabeth Bear, Mongoose. but she's also writing this with um, Sarah Monet. Yes, and um, a lot of uh, a lot of the name checking is fun. Again, the new weird is self-aware; it knows what it's doing. And part of its fun, okay, part of its play, as they would say today in post-structuralism, the way it plays, okay. There are a that, lot of Easter eggs in this story. Right. From, it, it, it wants us to connect with other stories. And in particular here, we're connecting with Lewis Carroll, okay, and Jabberwocky. We're connecting with, for instance, the Bandersnatch. The Hunting of the Snark, Yes. Okay. Uh, we're, we're connecting with a story called The Hounds of, of Tindalos uh, by Frank uh, Frank Long. It's one of his stories that he wrote. He was one That's of the right. Lovecraft Circle. That's right. In uh, Mongoose, the Bandersnatch has a genus and species name. It's Pseudocanus tindalosi. And what that means is pseudo dog or pseudo hound of Tindalos. And so that's a that's a shout out there. Okay, it seems a little bit obscure, but it's a shout out to one of the stories that inspires uh, Monet and Baird. Okay, and this and is again, this is a this is a culmination of what Lovecraft himself was trying to do. He was trying to encourage people to borrow ideas and and um, and concepts that other writers had done. And but this time, it's done much more in a in a meta type of way of doing it. Because it's not saying this is part of the Cthulhu mythos. This is saying we're aware of the Cthulhu mythos. We know that we're talking about the Cthulhu mythos. And we want you to, we're going to play around with it. We're going to give you some Easter eggs, some fun. We're going to name check uh, the Cthulhu mythos in the weird. And just, just to give you, give you guys a little bit of a thrill of saying, oh, I read that story. Yeah, and that's part of the fun. But here are our new weird dynamics. Number one, normalization. The very fact that we're going to give the Bandersnatch genus and species, pseudo, pseudo uh, canis uh, tendalosi, okay, uh, we're giving it genus and species. Uh, one thing that uh, Mongoose does is it gives us cats and dogs, 
Okay, Bandersnatch is the ultimate hound or dog. But, okay, our protagonist weird creature is the Cheshire. The Cheshire is a character that, or a type of creature that phases. It phases in what sense? It, at, one, at one point, it's occupying our world in a way that's tangible. At other points, even though it's still there, okay, it's operating according to the rules of another dimension, another universe. So it's phasing in and out of universes, okay? And it's, it's the very nature of a Cheshire to do that. And we were talking about this earlier, Peter and I, and it's interesting because this kind of parallels the normalization of science fiction uh, ideas as well. Because back when uh, Lovecraft was writing, this idea of this other dimension that's beyond time and space was seen as this horrific monstrosity that no one could fully understand or comprehend. Nowadays in science fiction, we call it hyperspace. And we have, it, it's a way for our spacecrafts in Star Trek or in Star Wars to go faster than the speed of light. It, it's become, again, this normalization of these weird concepts, which are now seen as almost tropes, as almost seen as something that's almost expected to be in the story. The uh, the 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 Cheshire, okay, uh, Israel Irizari, our protagonist, our human protagonist, has a partner in his pest control business, okay, and that's his Cheshire mongoose, and. Uh, Mon Mongoose is a, a character who has tendrils, a very Lovecraftian character, uh, feline in a way, but not really. A cat, well, I guess we're, are we to imagine a kind of Siamese cat on top of Israel's head <laughs> with its tail under his chin? Perhaps we are in a way until we realize we're talking about Okay, a character with tendrils, octopi tentacles, and at one point, when we first meet Mongoose, Mo uh, Mongoose has his, has the has her tendrils several times around the throat of Israel Irizari, and and we feel like, well, wait a minute, isn't that threatening? No, no, that's the way they communicate because because Mongoose is deaf. Okay, a very visual character, a character who sees, okay, but not a character who hears in any normal sense. And one way they communicate is through vibration. And so the tendrils of the mon of mongoose are all over, all over his face, his shoulder and his throat. Okay, but not in a threatening way. Yes, here's the word, loving. It's a loving, here we have a creature of the weird, Okay, adapted from Lewis Carroll. Lewis Carroll gave us the Cheshire Cat. Lewis Carroll gave us Tobes, gave us Wraths, and gave us Bandersnatch. Yes, these are Lewis Carroll's characters from Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass. That that world, from that world. Okay, uh, but at this at the same time, okay, we're not to be afraid of of mongoose mongoose is lovable okay and a, as a predator okay in the food chain can be used to to engage in pest control to control for the rodents or the vermin of space okay and and these are the toves these are the rats and if you don't control if you don't control for toves t-o-v-e-s toves and rats if you don't control for them, you're going to invite across time and space a creature that is all powerful and will destroy everything. And that's the Bandersnatch. And it's interesting because, again, we it, Sarah and, and Elizabeth, um, and I'm going to use their first names, uh, doing something interesting here. They look back and say, there's no difference between C.L. Moore's Black God Kiss and through the looking glass. They say that uh, one of the things that it seems like the weird has lost is that sense of whimsy. And uh, by the way, Lovecraft did write some whimsical type, type stories. He was influenced by another writer called um, Lord Dunsany, who wrote very whimsical weird stories. But again, I think the new weird has looked back and seen this, 
there's more and more of, of the weird being dragged into the realm of horror. And they're saying, no, it can be whimsical. It can be, it can be a loving story. It can be a positive story. It doesn't have to be. We don't have to face the weird with dread, as we keep saying. We can face it with optimism. And again, we, we've talked, I, I think I mentioned the idea of nihilistic optimism. It's that idea that once the once the old has been destroyed, it's not the end. It provides us instead with a blank, blank page or a blank, blank canvas on which we can create the new. And we'll end it there. Uh, next time we meet with you guys, we're going to be start talking about a new book. We're going to be talking about Lovecraft Country. If you haven't guessed yet, it is directly about Lovecraft. It is again one of those one of those very self-aware stories of the new weird that tries to address the old weird as well. See you then.